All right. <laughs> Hi, everybody. We're back, Sarah. <laughs> We're uh, back. <laughs> and super grateful that you're here. Um, not just saying that. I wanted to have you on the podcast for some time now. I'm sure all of us did. And so um, welcome. If you guys are here for the first time, welcome to the God is Awesome podcast, where we um, in, just interview people about their testimonies, about how God has been awesome in their lives. And um we want to say hi to Zeus, hey, who, Zeus. who just joined the room. <laughs> uh, it's our special live edition in person. Um, and it's because we just love, you know, having this live in person. Maybe maybe there was some <laughs> technical difficulties earlier, but we're moving past that. Um, and so, Sarah, what we do here is we just interview about what God has done in your life. And um, if someone can relate to that, if we would just like to build a community and share those experiences of how I'm God sorry. has uh, worked in your life. Um, if you guys are with us um, and you're watching this in the future, I uh, want to say like drop a hashtag replay down in the comment section below. Uh, be sure to like and give some Sarah, Sarah some uh, support and some love through the comments. She likes emojis and all that stuff. And I think it'll love be emojis. good. It'll be good. <laughs> um, and if you find like that this uh, her testimony is um, helpful for someone else, uh, might have similar testimonies, be sure to share this uh, video with them as well and invite them to the group and we'll just build out this community. Anyway, Sarah, uh, why don't you start off with a little bit about yourself? How, how long have you been a Christian? Um, how did you come to meet Christ? What was your like perspective in life and where did you come from and you know up until meeting Christ? Okay. Uh, well, I my story goes back pretty far. Uh, my dad was a pastor, and uh, my mom was actually children's ministry director, which is what I do now. And so I grew up in the church, and um, I grew up knowing who Jesus was and what he had done for me. Um, I do remember a time when I was probably about five years old. Um, I remember being very scared that if my family died and I died, that we would be separated, that I was definitely going to hell. And um, I can remember being a young child and being so afraid and praying with my mom. And uh, I genuinely believe that God heard and honored that, that cry from a little girl's heart. Um, but fast forward many, many years, and um, God took me through a lot of stuff, which I'm sure we'll kind of talk through uh, later on in the interview. But I, I truly believe that uh, about the age of 16 is when I fully surrendered my life um, to Christ and my faith kind of became my own, okay. if that makes sense. Did um, you, did you, when you were five to 16, mm -hmm. what happened there? Did you like, do you still worry about hell or? Um... <laughs> yeah, I, um, I was a girl full of a whole lot of, a whole lot of insecurities, a lot of emotional insecurities, um, spiritual insecurities. I can remember probably for like five years of my life, every single night laying in bed, praying a prayer of salvation. Um, because I thought maybe I hadn't prayed it hard enough or real enough, or maybe I hadn't really wanted forgiveness for my sins. And how could I really want forgiveness for my sins if I was still sinning yeah. and I didn't, you know, that was a real big disconnect for me. And so I went years thinking I wasn't really saved. I hadn't really meant it. And so there was a lot of insecurity in that. Um, I like want, how do you know? Like, how yeah, do I know I'm saved? Yeah, how do I know I'm saved? Yeah. And I think part of that, I think a lot of people struggle with that, but especially people who struggle with insecurity naturally. Mm -hmm. I think we kind of tend to struggle with, well, how could this God and this universe truly accept me and forgive me and love me? And uh, I went through a lot of years, uh, kind of during my teenage years, where I rebelled a little bit against my parents' faith. Okay. Um, I didn't want to go to church. I didn't want to be involved with what they wanted for me because it felt like it was theirs. Did you get dragged to church or did you just stay at home? Uh, for a while I got dragged to church and then for a while um, I was allowed to just stay home. And I was kind of shocked You're by that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you couldn't fight me back yeah, anymore. Gotcha. Um, so I, I, I do remember one Sunday, um, my dad telling me it was time to get ready for church and I said I didn't want to go. And his response was, okay. And I thought that was really strange that the pastor would say it was okay for his daughter to stay home from church. Oh, man. And um, in hindsight, I, I kind of I <laughs> see what my what my dad was doing. And I think he understood the struggle that was happening inside of me that okay. um, I, I hadn't claimed this yet for myself. How old were you? Uh, at that time, I was probably about 14. Gotcha. Yeah. So there was two years there of where you were trying to figure out your mm -hmm. faith. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, anything else that we should know um, going up to? Um, up until that point, 
probably not really. I mean, I was, I was a pretty typical kid. I know there are a lot of bad reputations about pastor's kids. Sure. Um, I don't think I met most of them, maybe a couple of yeah. them. <laughs> um, but I was, I was definitely, um, I was definitely an incredibly shy and insecure kid. It's kind of funny. I actually, you know, God is awesome. <laughs> That's the whole point of this <laughs> podcast. But who I am today is so dramatically different from who I was as a child. And, um, you know, I, I can remember having conversations with my mom now that I'm a parent and uh, her telling me, wow, Sarah, you're so blessed that your girls talk to you. You wouldn't talk to me. You wouldn't talk to anyone. And I had so much fear um, about what people would think of me if I said what I was thinking or what I was feeling. And, um, and so all of that just kind of played into those, those insecurities um, about my faith and about who I was even mm -hmm. as a person and my value and worth. Like so. how someone would see you or judge you yeah. based on your reactions mm -hmm. on, or how you felt. Exactly. How long yeah. did that continue to? Till? I would say, um, or do we still well, I mean, I, I still struggle with it, but I, that's why I'm saying like, God is awesome. I'm such a different person because yeah. I have this incredible confidence, not in myself, but in who I am through him that it kind of no longer really matters. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it was a really big deal back then. And, um, God just made a really big shift in my heart and in my life. So, so. talk to me about the shift then. So mm -hmm. you said at 16, you really made your faith your own. Yeah. What happened? What was the circumstances that would the light bulb just clicked or what happened? Yeah. Well, I think that um, when you take a, a teenage girl um, who's incredibly shy and incredibly insecure and unsure of herself and her worth um, and questioning the world and questioning God and his existence, um, a lot of bad things can come. From that. Um, we tend to, when we're insecure, we tend to start um, looking for love in the wrong places and looking for worth in the wrong places and valuing the wrong things. Mm -hmm. And so kind of in typical teenage fashion, that's a lot of what I was doing. Um, I was desperately searching for that thing that would make me feel like I was valued. Mm -hmm. And um, that led me to some really kind of um, dangerous and unhealthy situations. Okay. And um, I was not attending church regularly. I was involved with a lot of people I should not have been involved with. And um, one Sunday morning, I remember attending Sunday school. And um, So you're back to church. I'm back to church, yep. Okay. And I, I attended, not okay. regularly, but I attended. And at this point, I was attending because there were some cute boys in the youth group. There we go. Class, let's be there honest. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm a 15, 16-year-old girl, and there were cute boys. And um, so I'm attending Sunday school, and we had this new teacher, and I'll have to tag her in it later. Her name is Jill Holbert. And I remember walking into the room and thinking, wow, she's so beautiful, and she's so put together, and she spoke so eloquently. And um, I remember that day she spoke, and it was fine. It was a good lesson. But at the end, she said, you know, I feel like God has me here today for one of you. And I don't know who that is, but I'm here for one of you, and I'm not leaving until I know who it is. So she believed that God told her, talked to her, in whatever way she got mm -hmm. that message from then. She was here for one person. For one person. And I'm guessing that person was you. That person was me. Yeah. So how did and uh, so I actually, I had left the room and I came back for some reason. I can't remember what I had forgotten something. And uh, she was still sitting there. And in so many words, I don't remember her exact words, but um, she looked at me and she, she said, I, I knew it was you. Come sit down. No <laughs> and kidding. I'm like, okay, this woman who I thought, you know, was so put together and so cool. Now I'm thinking she's crazy. <laughs> and she's about to like call me out on a whole lot of stuff. And, um, God used her in really, really powerful ways. Jill, if you're, if you do end up watching this, um, and she knows this cause I've shared this with her over the years, but wow, God used you to save me in so many ways. And, um, she stepped alongside me and, um, through prayer and through just very casual discipleship, um, brought me out of a lot of ugliness and, um, brought me to a point where at a teen youth conference, I was able to just fall on my knees before God and recognize mm -hmm. who he was and, um, who I was because of him and because of his forgiveness. So because of a particular Sunday school teacher, was this the first time you met her or was this? I'm sure, Jill, I don't know. I'm, I'm sure that we had met each other before, um, this is just but I this had never situation. really, yeah, I had yeah. never really taken notice of her, had 
meaning to interact with her. So, and you can you can answer this. I mean, however way you want. I just want to clarify. I'm not sure. She's. You said she brought you out of a lot of ugliness in mm -hmm. a lot of ways. Yeah. Uh, are those? What does that mean? Like, is that mentally? Is I'm not. Um, I think it was a lot of things. I think she she helped me to be strong enough to walk away from some really. Um, dangerous and unhealthy situations that I was allowing myself to get involved with. Okay. Um, she loved me enough to speak truth hmm. into my life and to call me on those things. And, uh, oh. and she loved me enough to push me to do the things that she knew I needed to do, even okay. if I didn't want so, to. So yeah, I guess that's what I'm trying to figure out is yeah. like, what are the things that she told you she did with you? Mm -hmm. She said, Hey, you're messing up in these areas. Yeah you have to stop these things mm -hmm. and you should go this way. Yeah. It was very like, she was, yeah, she very was very, clear. she was very bold. She was very bold. And she was a mom of three teenage girls who are all beautiful, incredible women now. And, um, and God used that and just her ability to speak truth and life and love, wow. um, into the heart of a lonely girl. You know, a lot so. of people don't have that nowadays. Yeah. And, yeah. um, do you think and this is kind of, I'm not just kind of thinking and talking with you. Do you think that Christians should do this more often? When what situations and circumstances is this okay? Yeah. Uh, she only, you only met that one day. How long did your relationship last until she said something like that? Like, give me some like pra oh, practical steps. Here. I feel so old because the timeline is like sure. so muddled in my brain. <laughs> um, I I would say that we were probably in each other's lives for maybe like six or seven months okay. before. Um, she really encouraged me and pushed me to go to this youth conference um, where I really feel like I gave my heart to Jesus. Um, so you were but, discipled in a casual way yeah. for about six, seven months with this lady. Mm -hmm. And during that time, she's getting, she's, you know, into your life and doing these mm -hmm. things with you. Yeah. Getting you to think different ways. Yeah. What, why do you think, why do you think Christians don't do that more often? Like, why don't, why are, are we scared? Are we scared to call people out on their stuff? Are we are we scared to be called out? Mm -hmm. If so, we don't enter into a discipleship. Why do you think? Yeah, what's happening? I I think I think a lot of it boils down to fear. I think fear of saying the wrong thing, fear of how the person will respond to us. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of fear too of you know, is this really God telling me to say this to this person? Yeah, yeah. And um, we're so scared. We kind of walk on eggshells sometimes, yeah. especially if we're trying to hold somebody accountable. But man, it's what we're it's what we're called to do in love, right? It's what we're called to do, and um, and because of that, I mean, I think the trajectory of my life went from like this direction, literally, it was a shift mm -hmm. because this woman was bold enough to pour into me in that way, and yeah. so it's it's just yeah, it's just really incredible. And God used her um, later on in my story as well. I I had an incident one night. I was. And I'm dating myself because I don't remember how old I was, but I was probably about 18. Okay. And uh, my parents lived in Naples, Florida, and I went to school in West Palm. Okay. And uh, I was driving home one night, and it was so, so late. It was probably like 1 or 2 in the morning, and I just wanted to get home to my family. And it had been raining, and I was going across Alligator Alley, and I had a Dodge Neon. And I remember the highest the speedometer could go on my Dodge Neon was 110 miles an hour. And that's how fast I was going across Alligator Alley with the wet road. Oh, no. And um, my dad always, up until that point, teased me because when he was teaching me how to drive, whenever something would dart out in front of me, I would turn into it, like rather than like away. Like I was really <laughs> bad. We, we went driving like through the desert and there were tumbleweeds and I would like turn into the tumbleweeds and it was just a disaster. So I didn't have good experience with dodging things. So I'm driving 110 miles an hour, the road is wet, and an animal darts out in front of me and I jerked my wheel uh -huh. and um and my car hydroplaned and spun around and um if you're familiar with alligator alley it's long long stretch of highway with these bridges that go over swamps and back then there weren't a lot of guardrails across those areas that go into the swamps and uh I remember my car spinning out of control and I'm heading straight now and I took my hands off the wheel because I couldn't do anything. I couldn't brake. I couldn't steer. And I remember looking ahead of myself and seeing bridge on one side and bridge on the other side and nothing in the middle. And I remember thinking, oh my God, this is this is it. I'm done. I'm going into the canal. I'm going over hundred miles an hour. I'm I'm just done. And I took my hands off of the wheel and then I woke up. And when I woke up, my car was filled with smoke, which actually was powder from the airbags deploying. Um, the whole front part of my car was in the back of my car. Um, my car was destroyed, completely totaled. And at that time, I had hit one of only like two or three 
bridges on Alligator Alley that actually had a guardrail to stop it from going into the canal. And when the insurance adjuster looked at it, they said, there's no way you should be alive. You hit this thing going close to 100 miles an hour. You hit like a brick wall going 100 miles an hour. So anyway, back to Jill and how God used her and spoke to her. The next day I got a call from her and she said, are you okay? And I said, well, <laughs> crazy thing happened last night, but weird that you're calling me. Why do you ask that? And she said, because I don't know what happened, but last night at about two in the morning, the Holy Spirit woke me up. This lady's, this lady's got this some lady's crazy. Crazy. <laughs> this this lady's amazing. Got it's amazing. Power. The Holy Spirit woke me up and told me to get on my knees and pray for your protection. And she said, I did. I just spent time on my knees on the floor just praying for your protection. Sarah, what happened to you last night at two in the morning? And I just, I lost it. Um, and so that kind of goes back to what you were saying before. This is a woman <laughs> who faithfully followed the prompting of the Holy Spirit. She followed his prompting to sit in that room and talk to me. She followed his prompting to call me out on the choices I, were, I was making that were unhealthy. She followed his prompting to pray for me for protection that night. Um, and so just, just <laughs> should, we, should, we, should we follow God's prompting? Yes, yes, we should. And I try so hard to do that. But it's scary. It comes back to fear. It's scary, right, to, to sometimes speak when we are not sure how it will be heard um, or to wake up in the middle of the night and get on our knees and pray, like, no, God, I'm tired. I'm going back to sleep. But imagine if she had said that. Who knows? So anyway. This is crazy. Yeah, That's a yeah, crazy her, story. Her faithful testimony in my life. So That's crazy. Yeah. I've never, I mean, like, I'm a pastor, right? I've never had that happen to me. Yeah. Like, prompted or whatever. But I think that's a, that's definitely, that sounds like a spiritual sound, gift. Yeah, oh, absolutely. That sounds absolutely. like a legit spiritual gift. That I'm like, okay, I, yeah. okay, you got, you got it. Yeah. You got it. You got, you <laughs> yeah, got but it. she's doing it. <laughs> and um, yeah. wow, super very grateful that yeah. uh, she had that program. No doubt that she played a role in whatever role that, however God works those gifts to yeah. bless other people and keep them safe and stuff yeah. like that. Wow. That's amazing. If you have, um, if you have time, uh, Jill, Jill, Miss yeah. Jill, yeah. we would love to have you on this <laughs> podcast real quick. Let's say hi to a few people who joined us. Stephanie, Kim, Kimberly, and, oh, Kim, Kimmy and uh, Jesse, we'll see you guys. Uh, thanks for joining the podcast. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's keep it going here. So after that, you're about what, 18 now. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So t tell me what your journey looks like from 18 to now. Like, where, where yeah. have you gone? You, some, you mentioned that God's given you a calling in life. I'm not sure how that plays a role into, you know, between 18 and now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, knew from, I knew from a pretty early early age that I wanted to teach. Okay. That was something that I knew um, from a pretty early age. And um, God closed a lot of a lot of doors for me um, to keep me out of different fields. I also really wanted to act. Okay. Um, and he closed the door to the theater department that I was studying in. And he closed the door to um, a lot of opportunities in California. And he just kind of kept closing those doors. And it's um, a lot of pain, right? Sometimes? Yeah, it was hard. But um, I don't know. I, I kind of had a piece about it because I okay. kind of always knew that I was supposed to be doing something else. Even though I loved this, I, I needed to be doing something else. Something you love versus a calling. Yeah. Calling. Yeah. And at that point in time, I definitely wouldn't have called it a calling. I just would have said, oh, well, I'm good with kids. And so this is, you know, I okay. should be a teacher, yeah, you know, yeah. and have summers off and, yeah. you know, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> so um, benefits are okay. <laughs> benefits are okay. Yeah. So I actually, I, my undergrad degree was in communications, which was so funny. The fact that I wanted to study theater or communications at all, because like I said, I'm, I'm such a complete 180 of who I was as a child, okay. this incredibly shy and insecure person. God has just kind of grown. To, like, I love, I love to speak and yeah. I love to communicate and I'm, and I'm confident in that. And, um, after around the time I was graduating, um, I met my husband. I was actually, he cast me as his girlfriend. It was a smooth move, Maurizio. Ooh. He cast me as his girlfriend <laughs> in his senior project. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so we, you know, we played boyfriend and girlfriend and our first moments together are on film, which is kind of cool. Um, oh, yeah, that's cool. But we- uh, This play, man. Yeah, cool. yeah, it was really smooth, it was really smooth. So he was dating someone else and I was dating somebody else and it was fine, but um, God knew what he was doing. <laughs> God knew what he was doing. <laughs> and, uh, you know, long story short, uh, we became really, really good friends. And um, God brought this man into my life who just completely balanced me. Mm. And, um, you know, my head's kind of always in the clouds and his feet are kind of always on the ground. And so we, 
uh, decided to go on this journey together and enter the field of education together. Okay. And uh, he might say that I pulled him a little bit into that <laughs> in hindsight, but uh, that's what we did. And so we went to grad school, uh, we got engaged, and we moved down here to Florida. And at that time in my life, I would say um, I was I would say I was pretty spiritually dry. What do you mean? Um, by that? I had kind of gone through almost like this revival, right? So like at the age of 16, I give my life to Jesus and I attend a Christian college where, you know, every night you're out on the green with, you know, dudes in flip flops and guitars and we're worshiping oh. God together. Oh, that's what they our do? Starbucks. Oh, like, no it's all idea. you do okay. on a Christian campus, right? And um, so this just very spiritually alive place. And, um, and then I moved to northern New Jersey and... Um, you know, started attending grad school and just kind of hit this rut in my spiritual life. And um, not going to church, not reading. The uh, Bible. Well, we were attending. We were attending my dad's church. My husband okay. and I. Well, my fiance at the time. Um, we were attending my dad's church, and um, we were actually serving together. We were teaching Sunday school together. So, and all, so I was on the outside. Yeah. You know, on the outside, I was doing everything I was supposed to be doing. Um, but was I really allowing God to? impact me and change me here. Um, there was kind of a spiritual disconnect. And so uh, through our move, um, we ended up down here in Port St. Lucie. And we spent a lot of years kind of um, church hopping and never really feeling connected anywhere. Uh, we spent a lot of years kind of letting our kids be our excuse and our reason for why we didn't attend church. Oh, they cry in the nursery mm, so gotcha. you know it's easier if we just stay home right. and they have separation anxiety and you know kind of all those things kind of came into play um and then god led us to uh led us to calvary which was the first place um since i sat under my father's teaching where i really heard solid solid Bible teaching. Mm. And um, and it was really good. Both my husband and I actually enjoyed yeah. going to church. Again. And Calvary's and a great church. It's a great church. Yeah, yeah. It's a wonderful church. And Pastor Mike's awesome. And um, and it was really good. It was a really good time, I think, for my husband spiritually as well, because he was sitting under somebody who he respected and that he was learning from. Um, and we eventually made our way over here to Sunlight. And um, I kind of hit a point in my my education career where God really started talking to me. How long um, ago was this? This would have been about five years ago, oh, maybe a little bit longer, maybe okay. six. Gotcha. And um, I finally hit a point where God was really speaking to me. I had started teaching middle school. Oh, and, Lord help you. Yeah, you can relate. <laughs> <laughs> and talk about a spiritually like dead or oppressed place. Sure, it, oppre is, oppressed. <laughs> <laughs> it is middle school. Gotcha. I was teaching seventh grade. It's like your exile. And, uh, yeah, it's horrible. <laughs> and I remember coming home every day just crying and being so frustrated. And at first I thought I was frustrated because these kids were so bad and they were so mean and they were so disrespectful. And what I realized after a while was actually I was frustrated because I couldn't offer them a solution that would work. Um, I couldn't pray with them and I couldn't point them to Jesus. And this began to be this kind of inner turmoil in my heart. And um, God slowly, it, it's so funny, like you look back in hindsight, right? And you see God kind of, you know, prepping you, setting up and then opening doors to get you to where exactly where he wants you to be. And um, God opened a door for me to teach here at Sunlight at the preschool. And I tell people all the time, it's just the best year of my life. Just how much I grew spiritually through the simplicity of prayer and song with four-year-olds. Sure. I mean, just, we weren't doing any deep theological studies. We weren't, you know, anything like that. We were just loving Jesus and loving each other. And it was just a really profound year for me. And um, during... Yeah, isn't that funny? Like how you could be in like a children's sermon or yeah. less in your life. Like you're just like learning, <laughs> like, yeah. like doing VVS and stuff. Like I'm just learning from like these these stories that we kind of yeah, the, yeah, just, yeah. It's yeah, incredible. I, I, didn't know that. <laughs> I, I have to tell you, if you are somebody who is struggling or worried that you don't know enough about the Bible to serve or you don't know where God wants you, children's ministry. I can't tell you how many of our Sunday school teachers <laughs> come up to me after a lesson and say, "Wow." Yeah. I just learned so much from you jumping around and being silly on stage. Sure, like sure. I, it's, it's profound. These kids don't yeah. appreciate this. <laughs> <laughs> like, this is deep stuff. This is yeah, incredible. That's funny. And um, it was during that year at sunlight um, that Scott approached me and 
asked me about the children's ministry director position. Gotcha. And um, at this point, I think at this point in my life, um, I was, you know, completely secure in my salvation. I knew who I was in Christ. I, you know, I was reading God's word. I was attending church. I was doing all of those things. Did I feel I had a call on my life? No, okay. not at all. And um, when he approached me, I actually, I laughed at him. And I think, That's funny. I think I told him he was crazy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I said, you know, listen, I grew up watching my parents in ministry. I, I know how difficult ministry is and what yeah. it can do to a family. And I said, no, I, I can't. Yeah. This isn't me. And uh, I remember he looked at me and he said, well, Sarah, I think you're called to this, but you don't know you're called to this. And I'm just going to sit and watch until you realize you're called to this. Mm. And so, again, it was somebody who was bold enough to just kind of speak sure. truth into my life that I needed to hear that maybe I didn't want to hear. Yeah. And um, eventually, because Scott could sell anything to anybody, <laughs> he, uh, he sold me on this position. And I'll be very honest, I stepped into this position feeling equipped because of my experience and my gifts, but not called. Okay. Um, I felt very, very resistant. Gotcha. And um, man, God's good, yeah. <laughs> and God's faithful. And I, I mean, I, I can look now at the end of, of four years and say, this is what He was doing the entire time. Yeah. Like, this is what He was doing. Um, you know, in my insecurities as a young child, and now my heart and my empathy for young children. And this is what He was doing in my teenage years when I, I didn't know what I believed. I. I don't know. This is what he was doing when he took this shy little girl and made her a theater major and a communications major. This yeah. is what he was doing when he put me in a public school classroom and gave me a yearning to pray with children and to lead them to Jesus. Like, this is what he was doing yeah, the whole time. All through your life, these mm -hmm. big instances, these big movements. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it's what he was doing, um, you know, and having me watch my mom. My mom was a children's ministry director sure. pretty much of every church that my dad pastored and, um, and watching her and her heart and commitment and... Um, you know, I think I think we're all called to serve. That's that's the we're all called. Yeah. And if any of us say we're not called, we're lying to ourselves. Yeah. We are all called, um, but it's just where God's preparing you to land. Yeah. So you said something earlier. Uh, you said uh, you said no because you saw how difficult ministry can be. Mm -hmm. um, talk to us about that. Talk to me about that. How? What's difficult about ministry? Hmm. Well, I think I. I came at it uh, from the perspective of somebody who had watched her family um, get hurt a lot by people. What do you mean? Um, I think watching my father in um, church situations that uh, were just incredibly unhealthy, where, you know, lies were spread, where rumors uh. were cast, or, you know, votes were had behind closed doors, and um, there, there was a lot of hurt. And so I think that my initial, my initial wall was, I don't want any of that. I don't want that hurt. And I don't want, I don't want to be let down by people who are supposed to be more like Jesus than anybody sure. else. You, know? you saw your dad serve these people, mm -hmm. pastor these people, mm -hmm. and then they go around and they have like secret meetings about him. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, it, and, you know, we were in some very healthy churches and, um, and we were in some very unhealthy churches. And I think it's funny. I was actually having a conversation um, with somebody about that this morning, who's carrying a lot of baggage of, you know, what's happened in her life and how she's been treated by people from the church. And um, I think what, what God has taught me is that I have to release what people have done because I'm just as sinful and I'm just as guilty daily. I'm just as sinful. I'm just as guilty. And I have to release what people have done and not stop that. I'm not let that stop me from doing what God has called me to, because what those people did to my family or how those people treated my family um, or your what father, someone, your father's, those people in your father's congregation. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. How they treated us or how someone, you know, here could treat me, uh, you know, on any given day, anyone can rub us the wrong way. Right. I'm curious and, about that. Yeah. I'm curious about that. Like what is ministry like and how's it been difficult for you? Like you saw that you knew that going in, mm -hmm. but what does that mean? Um, because, you know, we have probably have a lot of people watching this mm -hmm. in our church. Like what happens um, in the church that you serve mm 
Mm -hmm. that makes ministry more difficult than probably it should be. Mm -hmm. Well, and no names. Yeah, right no. Oh no, gosh, no. Oh gosh, like, no. Well, actually, yeah, this person right let here. me call someone out. No, no. I, I think kind of just what I was saying before is that our our hurts are from people, and that's not who God is. That's not who God is. Um, I think that when you open yourself up to serve, um, you open yourself up to be misinterpreted. Mm. You open yourself up um, to being scrutinized and criticized. What do you mean by that? Scrutinized and criticized. What does that mean? Um, well, people are watching you. Yeah. Right. I mean, we're told as as teachers of the word that we're held to we're held to this higher standard, mm -hmm. right? And so, um, people can be very judgmental of decisions that you make. If you know, none of us want to be hypocrites, but do our lives always look the, the way that are we're... those decisions like professionally in a church setting or like like personally, like with your family? What do you mean by that? Um, I think it could be either way. Okay. I think it could be either way. I think, um, I think that something happens, uh, when you're in any type of leadership position, whether it's in church or in the business world, um, you tend to be seen as, as up here, right. right? And, um, you're, you're kind of untouchable and, um, you must be that much closer to God. And, and the reality of the situation is that you're just as broken and you're just as hurt and you are just as sinful yeah. as everyone else that you're serving. Yeah. And so I think that, um, I don't know, I think that we do our leadership a disservice when we put them on a pedestal that maybe they shouldn't be on. Okay. And um, I think that that's where some of the, some of the hurts and um, the pain can kind of come from gotcha. because we're people. And yeah. we're, unfortunately, we're going to let each other down. Yeah. And you're happen. coming into it with like a, a heart to serve and mm -hmm. you're getting scrutinized and criticized yeah. and all this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And that's hard. That's hard to watch. It's hard to see. Has so. your family, how's your family doing with this? Cause a lot of times when we go into ministry together, we bring our families along. Mm -hmm. How mm -hmm. are your girls taking ministry and you in ministry? How's your husband taking you in ministry? Is this something, is it something that's been, you know, edifying has been helping has been hurting? Like, is there difficulties? Is there successes? What's going on? Um, I think that there's both. I think there's, I think there'll, there's always both yeah. in every home. Um, I think that my, my children are benefiting so much, um, the same way that I had the benefit of seeing my parents serve selflessly. Right. Yeah, that makes a you lot know, of sense. so it's like, you know, there's, there's, there's just this incredible benefit. There's nothing I love more than, you know, if I'm on stage and I'm sharing a lesson with kids, watching my girls watching me like it's just it's a really cool thing oh, you know dude. it's a really really cool thing yeah. and um so there's that there's that incredible benefit um i think that i think that what people maybe don't understand about ministry is that it's so people centered um it's not a nine to five job no it's not at all and um there are so many nights where i'm responding to people that i truly truly care about you know at 11:30 midnight you know we're messaging back and forth or we need to talk because there's a crisis going on and um and so i think that can become difficult in a home environment because where's the line sure. you know if you work in an office at five o'clock you punch out and you come and home and you don't bring that with you right yeah. maybe you'll have the story about the one annoying customer but then yeah. you're done and yeah. that's it and so i i think probably if my if my husband had anything to say it would probably just be that he sees me drained because it's a draining thing yeah and uh, gosh all the glory goes to god yeah. if i can be drained for his glory yeah. then great but you know, your marriage can suffer because of that and your home life can suffer. And so you, you do have to be very mindful with boundaries. Right. And I know that's something that's so important to you too, yeah. is just setting those really healthy boundaries. So. Yeah. Wow. That, yeah. And that's, that's super insightful, especially when you know that you're being filled uh, by Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, you're draining out, you're being, what Paul says, being poured out to other people. Mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Yeah. Wow. So maybe we'll, we'll end with uh, maybe two questions. How, how was your time? What Looking back on your last four years of mm -hmm. being a children's ministry director, mm -hmm. Uh, how can you describe it to us? Like, how is it, what's the biggest wins? What What are like the biggest takeaways from it? Say you had to leave Gosh. and you've been called out somewhere else. Like, what is it that you were, you know, reflective on in the last four years of ministry? Man, there's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> um, honestly, I think for me, the biggest wins are um, the really sweet relationships 
that you're able to form, right? Let's do it. Um, both with both with the children and with my volunteers. Gotcha. Um, you know, there's there's nothing sweeter than an eight or nine year old kid, you know, coming up to you after a lesson and just saying, "Miss Sarah, can we just pray? Will you just pray with me?" No. Um, or no, you know. So um, you know, just this morning I got a, a sweet, encouraging text message from a parent and they had asked their child, you know, who's your, and this, I'm not saying this to brag, it was just, it was just an encouraging message, but who's your favorite teacher at school? And, um, and he said, oh, Miss Sarah, because oh, she teaches me about God. Oh, man. And, you know, he sees me once a week for 20 minutes, you know? And so that's all, that's all God. Like sure. he's given me this incredible privilege to connect with these kids in a way that maybe nobody else is really connecting sure. to them through, yeah. you know, and um, it's an incredible honor. Yeah. So, I mean, despite, you know, numbers and big events and all that stuff, it's kind of like the fluff. Yeah. And when you get down to it, it's it's those sweet little things. When you where, remember what mm -hmm. mattered. It's yeah, these yeah, it's these moments. And I just, you know, I I pray, I pray daily that maybe one day I'll be a Jill in somebody else's life and um gosh i think if i could God, i'll cry <laughs> if you know me that's what i do um but if i could be a jill you know to one person how how amazing so anyway yeah 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 you said your volunteers too right your volunteers. yeah yeah um any volunteers you want to shout out i, I don't want to, not all of them, i don't of i don't, I don't want to put anyone on the spot or embarrass anybody but you know just this sunday I, I had just the sweetest conversation um with just one of my favorite women she's just awesome and um she was sharing how you know she's hasn't really felt comfortable or confident at church and how you know i I reached out to her and asked her to serve in children's ministry and she now feels at home she found a place. and she's found yeah. a place. And I actually, I just reached out to her the other day and said, Hey, can we meet for discipleship? And she's like, yes. And, and she's, you know, this is all so new to her. And yeah. so, and so I think it's, it's those little things. I get this, this privilege in children's ministry, not only of, of seeing the children grow, but seeing it as a place where people who are just baby Christians can come and feel, I don't know, not intimidated yeah. and feel safe yeah, and safe. um and feel like they can grow yeah and so i think that's really really cool it's not just for kids it's for the grown-ups too yeah. so yeah all right well uh we got one last question to ask you miss mm. jill i mean sarah uh, <laughs> one day miss jill what why do you think god is awesome oh man <laughs> i think god is awesome um because he took an incredibly insecure, shy, um, hopeless, quiet little girl and turned her into just the complete opposite, all for his glory, not for my glory, not for my benefit. I could have gone through my life just fine, you know, any which way that he had made me, um, but all for his glory. And um, I think he is awesome because he speaks to us and he moves us and uh when we learn to hear him and when we learn to respond to him that's when we start to see god at work in our lives yeah. and so i don't know i guess i would just encourage anyone out there to be listening and to be watching because god's moving yeah. he's moving so man this is such a good podcast <laughs> <laughs> well, it man. all worked out <laughs> yeah i want to thank you for being on the show yeah thank um, you for having me yeah thanks, thanks for being interviewed i know there's a lot of like vulnerability and uh, a lot of I mean, we, this was only what, like 40 minutes or so. And there's a lot of like mm -hmm. history and there's a lot more that God has done in your life and the nuances of it that you could, we couldn't cover in this time, mm -hmm. but, um, we really want to praise God for his work in your life for mm -hmm. sure. Um, well, that's all we have time for guys. Uh, if you guys would please just like, and share this video and tell Sarah just what a great job she's done on the, on camera here. <laughs> uh, and be sure to invite people to Facebook and it's such a good podcast. You guys need to re-listen to this one. Anyway, um, we'll see you guys later. Thanks for tuning in. Bye, guys. See you guys.